I'm just passing through. How about you? <laughs> just passing through. Heavenly Father, I'm so glad we're not home yet here in this earth, but I'm so glad we're going home and we'll be there soon. Lord, this is not our home. We're passing through. God, make that real to us this morning. Sanctify the word, sanctify our ears. Let us hear what the Spirit has to say. Thank you for truth that sets men free. We give ourselves to you now to hear the word of the Lord, the living, life-changing word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm just passing through. I had a dear sister of the church uh, approached me backstage uh, recently. She's probably here this morning. And uh, she said, Pastor Dave, I've just come through a horrible experience. I can't explain the reason for it. She said, everything seems to be well. My children are doing well and they love me. My job is all right. I have no financial crisis, but still I found myself in the battle of my life. I'm just coming out of it, but I can't explain how or why it came on me. But I've, I've just gone through an experience I didn't think I was going to come out of. It was awful. I'm just now beginning to see the light. And I'm hearing that kind of confession from people all the United States. We have a mailing list of, of uh, nearly 800,000 people from all over the world. And even ministers write to us and tell us that they are fighting the most intense battle they've ever fought in their lifetime. And we hear that from all over the country. And I've never, in all the years we've had, uh, been writing and sending a message out, heard from so many hurting people that say, I don't know what's happened. I've never been tested like I'm being tested now. As one pastor wrote, he said, for no apparent reason, I fell into a pit of despair lately. I walk with God. I live in victory. I pray and seek the Lord faithfully. But a despondency has come upon me. And I thought I was not going to come out of it. I can't explain where it came from, everything else. There's no apparent reason for it. It just came on me. Despair, despondency, a sense of uselessness, emptiness. Now, of course, Christians have always suffered from the very beginning of time. In fact, the Bible makes it clear. Many of the afflictions of the righteous, if the Lord delivers them from them all. Also, we are partakers in Christ's sufferings, First Peter 4.13. Now... Beloved, it's not so with the wicked out there. The wicked that you work with on your job do not suffer in the same manner in which believers who love Jesus suffer. In fact, the scripture says, Psalm 73, 4 and 5, the wicked, their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They increase in riches. Now, of course, the ungodly suffer the wages of sin. Those who work with you, yes, they weep, they cry, they're in despair, they have depression, despondency. And the problem is, the only way they can get a little bit of relief is to go to drugs, alcohol, sex, pleasure. And they go wild trying to quiet that despair or bring themselves out of the pit. Yes, the wicked do suffer. There is no peace to the wicked, the Bible says. But if you're in love with Jesus... And if he's your purpose for living, as long as you're absent from Christ, as long as you're in this physical body and you're absent from the Lord, you're going to have what I call divine dissatisfaction. Nothing in this world is going to make you really happy. You are always going to be reaching for something that you can't touch. There's going to be something in you that cannot be satisfied by any material thing on this earth. Not a house, a new house, furniture, cars, possessions. They'll give you a little bit of pleasure, but the time will come when even those things give you no pleasure whatsoever. They don't scratch the itch that's in you. There's something in you reaching out. There is a dis divine dissatisfaction that God himself has placed in your life. Oh, hear me, folks. I know what I'm talking about. This divine dissatisfaction. You, you can, you can have a wonderful marriage. You can have a wonderful family. Be surrounded with love and still there'll be a season hit you when you feel so empty inside. You feel there's, there's something missing. Now, when the world says there's got to be more to life than this, that's dangerous. 
Because they can't fulfill it. That need there is God. And they can't reach that need because they don't turn to the Lord. But when a Christian says... There's got to be more than this. That is good. That is the Holy Spirit in you saying, this is not your home. There is more. And it's over there. It's where he is. You say, well, Brother Wilkes, in the, isn't he here with us? The Bible said we're in union with Christ. Paul said, nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Didn't Jesus said, I will come to you and manifest myself? Don't we have that wonderful union with him? Yes, he is here with us where we are, but we're not here, there with him where he is. We're not there yet. And until, see, we're still here in this body, and it has limitations. God can only give so much from, from this great reservoir of what he is. This great reservoir of peace and joy and pleasures forevermore. All of this that we're going to experience in eternity, we can't experience now because we have the Holy Ghost in measure. Can you imagine trying to ship the ocean to you through a straw? And that's about what it's like. We can only, we can only contain that little straw. This whole thing is, is reserved over here and it creates in us a divine dissatisfaction. I know what it's like. To, to walk the streets of New York and say, look, God's blessed me. My family's being blessed. The church is being blessed. I'm not in a financial crisis. I've got health. I've got strength. But something's missing. I'm really not totally satisfied. And, and you, 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 sometimes you get discouraged about saying, well, why am I dissatisfied? Why am I still reaching? What is it I'm looking for? That's a good thing, folks. Don't anymore after the Lord began to speak to me about that. I'm not uh, I'm not bashful about it anymore. I'm not fearful about those feelings of uh, reaching out, the feeling of being unfulfilled yet, the feeling of being not totally satisfied because that's the Holy Spirit in me. That is my yearning heart, yearning. I'm not going to be fully satisfied. I'm not going to be totally satisfied. And the Lord won't let me get totally satisfied with anything on this earth. That's the Holy Ghost reaching out, saying, this is not your home. This is not your place. Hallelujah. Knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We're absent from the Lord. Now, for those who are devoted to Jesus, you're never going to know satisfaction in this world as long as you're absent from him in body. Hallelujah. The lovers of Jesus have this divine dissatisfaction in them at all times. It never goes away. This, beyond divine dissatisfaction, though, God allows his people to experience tremendous afflictions and sufferings for a reason. God has a purpose in them. He allows them. And it's been that way from the very beginning of time, from the very first man, I believe, to this very time. It's because God is determined that none who love him will become rooted to this earth. He will not allow you to take roots here. God will not sit idly by and allow his beloved ones to settle down into material lifestyle and be happy and satisfied with anything that's material. And he'll stir your nest. He'll turn up the furnace. And he has a reason to wean us from the love of this world. It's a pattern all through scripture. Remember when God said it's time? For the children of Israel to move, it's time to go into the promised land to the very day. God God knew when the day was coming, the very day and the hour when the years would be up. And God allowed the affliction, the furnace of affliction to be turned up. The scripture makes it very, very clear that the children of Israel had settled in the land, even though they were slaves in brick ovens. The Bible makes it clear that they were addicted to their flesh pots. They were addicted to their vegetables, the leeks and the garlics and the onions and the lettuce and, and all of the wonderful gardens. And they had flesh pots and they had built homes and they were settled in the land. How many Israelites do you believe would have been ready to go at the Passover and leave if God hadn't allowed the furnace to be turned up? How many of you believe 
or I really believe this with all my heart, that there wouldn't have been a half a crowd. I don't think half the children of Israel would have wanted to leave until the, this was said. Let more work be laid upon the men. Give them no straw. Let them gather stubble throughout the land. Let the taskmasters beat them. Now, I want you to know it must have grieved the heart of God to see those taskmasters beating his children. It had to be something for the Lord to stand by and watch them being abhorred by the Egyptians and mocked and ridiculed and mistreated. It had to be grievous to the heart of God, and yet he knew that they had to be weaned from Egypt because they had taken roots in the soil there. And many of you are going through something that you don't understand right now. Many of you are going through despair, depression. You're going through the battle of your life and you don't understand it. But I want you to know the love of God permits it. The love of God does it. To wean us from the world, to give us a new Jerusalem state of mind. He's not going to let you live in a New York state of mind or a New Jersey state of mind. He's going to give you a new Jerusalem state of mind. And just on the brink of deliverance, the Lord turns the furnace up. He allows Pharaoh to come. He allows the enemy. Pharaoh is a type of the devil. The devil can't touch any of you if you're under the blood of Jesus unless the Lord lets, unless the Lord lets down the wall. You didn't let me finish. Until the Lord lets down the wall. He let the wall down for the enemy to get to Job. He has to let the wall down. He has a reason for it. I believe this with all my heart. If God sees that you're settled down, if, if you are not really living expecting the Lord's coming, if you become a little lax, you're not waking up every day saying, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You're not into the book. You're getting a little lukewarm. You're getting a little cold. And so the Lord says, I'm going to turn up the furnace. I'm going to let a little heat come in. I'm going to let some more affliction come at you. And the Lord's trying to wake us up. The Lord's trying to get us. I'll tell you something. By the time the Passover came and the death angel moved through the land, they were packed. They were ready. I mean, the donkeys were outside the door and their carts were ready. The sheep were all gathered, herded together. Grandma had all of her apron. She had everything. Mom was ready. Dad was ready. And when the trumpet said, when the sound came, said, we're marching. Grandpa, Grandma, we're out of here. We're out of here. No more slavery. No more brick ovens. They wouldn't have been able to say that just a few months before. They had to be afflicted to chase them out. God's chasing you out of our, out of our lethargies chasing us, out of our rootedness into this world, out of our materialism. Oh, folks, God has, God has no, uh, problem with your prosperity. I tell you, he does have a problem with the kind of prosperity you see today's New York Times. It says, uh, America is puffed up by pros- prosperity and the United States is strutting its stuff. It says, triumph and self-satisfaction are rising in America. Profits are strong. Unemployment is low. Jobs are multiplying. Inflation is inconsequential. The stock market's booming. Product quality is improving. And we are now strutting our stuff. That scares me to death. Whew. Pride goes before. But you see, always in times of prosperity... God is speaking to people because it's so easy to get hooked. It's so easy to, to get this settled state of mind instead of saying, I'm ready to go. I want to be with the Lord. I'm absent from the Lord. God has a purpose. Now, God allows our troubles and afflictions and disappointments to remind us that we are not citizens of this country. We are registered as citizens in Zion, my Bible says. We are not here. We are just passing through. Now, I'm a loyal American. I thank God for America. But here in this church, we have over 103 nationalities. And so it, your your homeland uh, may be, I don't know, you may be from Africa, you may be from the Caribbean, you may be from India, uh, Philippines. We've got people from all over the world here. But you came because this, many of you are here because you were looking for a better country. 
The Bible says Abraham, by faith, sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, for he looked for a city who had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And the Bible said they were looking for a better country. Many of you came to the United States looking for the better country. I would tell you, this is not it. <laughs> They're not it. Some of you think, well, Brother Dave, I can just get a green card. I'm in paradise. <laughs> no, it's not a green card. Now, I, I believe if you've come to America and this is your country, now you should be a loyal, tax-paying citizen. Yes, fine. Thank God. I give him praise. I love, I love to be in the land of freedom. Yes. But I do not belong here. My home is not here. My mansion is in Glory Avenue, near the Sea of Glass, near the throne of God. Pastor Carter's on Hallelujah Boulevard near... Near Patriarch Square. Bible says so clearly, Abraham said, I, I am passing through, I'm a stranger, I'm a pilgrim. In a strange land means hostile, belonging to somebody else. For us, this is a hostile environment. We thank God we're here to evangelize, we're here to be uh, leavened in the lump, so to speak. But we're to hold it lightly. You hold your prosperity lightly. You hold all the blessings of God lightly. Thank God for them, but hold them lightly. Be willing to give them up. Be willing to go. Abraham said, I'm a sojourner. That means I'm staying here temporarily. It's a strange land. Moses reminded Israel, you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Even David, in his prosperity, prayed, I'm a stranger. I'm a sojourner as all my fathers were. All my fathers were, were just passing through. So it is with me. I want you to go to Hebrews 11 chapter, if you will, please. Hebrews 11. I'm beginning to preach now. <laughs> Hebrews 11. As soon as you get to go to verse 13, if you will, please. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 13. I'm going to read through verse 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out. What country did you come from? The Bible says these people have a confession. They're not talk, They're looking for country. But they're not looking to go back where they came from. They're looking beyond that. They're looking for something else. And truly, if they'd been mindful of that country from which they came, they might have an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better country that is heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Glory to God. You see, these all died in faith, and he, he names these men, Abel, Enoch, in this 11th chapter, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and even Sarah, Abraham's wife. And they all made a confession. They all lived with some, a truth that they embraced. They embraced it, they lived it, they talked it. We are not... Citizens here on this planet. We don't belong here. We are passing through and we are going to a city that God has prepared. Now, the Bible says that Abraham made this confession. And I believe he, I believe he made this confession to his son Isaac. He taught him. Isaac embraced it. And he taught it to his, to the grandson of Abraham, to Jacob. Isaac's son. He embraced this. And the Bible says that they all embraced this truth. They embraced, they testified to it. it. was the confession they made. And they lived with it night and day. Have you made that confession yet? Do you live it? Do you embrace it? I am passing through. I am not taking roots. I'm not going to settle down here. I'm not going to fall in love with it. I'm going to keep my eyes on the heavenly prize that calling God in Christ Jesus. I, I'm looking for a heavenly country. 
Can you imagine what a conversation with Abraham must have been like? For example, Abimelech, he says to Abraham, perhaps you've been here living among us for quite a while. Why don't you settle down? You're being prospered. We love you and you love us. We're having a wonderful time here. Why don't you join us? Why don't you build a house here? Why don't you stay? And by the way, Abraham, what country are you from? Where you, would you come from? He said, well, that doesn't matter. Abraham answered, I, it, it, it doesn't matter. As far as settling here, I can't because I'm just passing through because I'm on my way to my country. Well, what is your country? Well, it's in paradise. In paradise? Yeah, it's in paradise. And while I'm here talking to you, Abimelech, my heavenly father is building a city and a place for me. And that's where I'm going. I'm heading. I don't get there till I die, but I'm going there and I'm just passing through. If you make this kind of confession and you talk about it on your job, it's going to mark you as insane. Can you imagine how it, can you just imagine you're on the job and some, about 25, 30 of your coworkers are in the lunchroom and they're having lunch and you haven't come in yet. And a man that you work with comes in and he tells the whole group, he said, listen, I, I've heard the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. He said, you remember those 39 people committed suicide because they said a spaceship's going to come and take them to their land? He said, we've got one on the job worse than that. <laughs> we got a guy in shipping that goes to Times Square Church. And he's not waiting for a spaceship. This guy's spaced out. He's saying he's waiting for the Lord himself to park in the heavens and come and get him. This guy said he's going to wait there in the sky and the trumpet's going to sound. And then not a spaceship, but he said an angel going to come and get him. And he's going to take him there. And you know something else? He says that he's going to be gone in the twinkling of an eye. And you know what this crazy man says from Times Square Church? That he's going to a mansion in a city that's got streets with gold. And not only that, he said he's going to be dressed in white and he's going to have a new body and a crown. And he says, now I know the world's gone crazy. Nobody will believe it. But folks, I believe in a real, literal heaven with streets you can walk on. But I sure don't want golden flowers. I want flowers you can smell. I heard somebody talk about dream they had of heaven. Everything was gold. The flowers, the trees, and everything. I, no, they're, they're real. There's a, there's, a, there's a glorious planet. There's a city that God is building. Builder and maker is God. A heavenly kingdom. Hallelujah. And we are to keep this ever most in our minds. Ever most in our minds. The Hebrew writer said, they declared plainly. They made it very clear, in other words, that they seek a country. They're not thinking of returning to anything on this earth. Hallelujah. Paul said, I have a desire to depart and be with the Lord. Philippians 1.23. Listen to me, please. I believe that any believer who's living victoriously and living an overcoming life, I believe those who have a passionate love for Jesus have within them at all times, every waking hour, this desire to go home and be with the Lord. To be with the Lord. Do you have that this morning? Is there something in you that says, Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Is there something that says, Lord, I'm here only to do your will. I'm here only to win my family to Christ. I'm here only to be a witness for him. I'm here to finish the work of Jesus Christ, and I want to get out of here. I want to go home with Jesus. That should be in every one of our hearts. That should be a hope that is in us. In the sense that I am truly just passing through. It's not like the young lady who is getting married. This was June. She's getting married in July. And she said, oh, Lord, please delay your coming six months at least. I'm getting married. No. There's something that says there's nothing, not marriage. Not children, not family, not even Times Square Church, 
Not even the fellowship of the saints. Because I want to be where he is. I want to be in his presence. I want to be bodily. Now, folks, Jesus has a body. He's not just spirit. He's a body. You can see him. You can touch. He has hair. He has eyes. He's got a mouth. He's got hands. He's got feet. He walks. He talks. And he's going to, you are going to be in glory, be able to embrace the son of God. You're going to be able to talk to him face to face. We have an eternity with him. And if you love him now, who having not seen yet we love. If you love him now, can you imagine? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we're no longer absent from the Lord in body? But a new body just like his, in total union with him for an eternity. Why would anybody want any tinsel from this world? Why would anybody settle for anything that's materialistic? But listen to what Peter said. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Now, let, let me get right down to the heart of what God's put on my soul this morning. Peter is dressing those who have obtained mercy who are numbered with God's people as pilgrims and strangers. He's talking to those who consider themselves pilgrims and strangers. This is a people, he says, that have come to the confession, we're just passing through, and they're looking for a heavenly city. But then he turns to these same people who have obtained mercy, who are pilgrims and strangers. He said, now, I want you to abstain from all fleshly lust. Because he's saying that lust detour you from this uh, this walk into uh, passing through the land, just going through because you become detoured. Your lust will hold you back. Your lust will take you on another road. And let me tell you something, and I want you to listen very closely. There are a number in this church this morning that call Times Square Church their home. There may be some of you visiting here this morning. You sing with us. You worship with us. It looks wonderful from the outside. Nobody would know what you're going through. They don't know that secret thing that's hidden in your life. They don't know about the lust that you've been indulging in. And perhaps even this past week. And you sit among God's people and you say, I'm a pilgrim. I'm just passing through. I'm really looking for heaven. I'm, I want to be with Jesus. Do you really want to be with him with that thing still in your life? You still want to stand before him knowing that you have not even uh, finished the battle here? That you have not taken advantage of the preaching you've heard? You have not allowed the Holy Ghost to come and empower you over your sin? You, you have heard preaching about it and yet you still indulge and you hold on a little longer, a little longer? What about those here right now hearing me and who will be hearing me on this tape that are still practicing homosexuality and lesbianism? And yet, and yet you come to the house of God, and I'm not raining on you. I speak to you as a shepherd. And the, the word of the Lord says, if you're a pilgrim, you're a stranger, you're going to abstain from fleshly lust. Have not been abstaining. You're still indulging. And you say, all of this in Jesus too. You want this little place in your life. You still want to hold on to this. Or this thing still has a hold on you. It can be drinking, it can be drugs, it can be lust, it can be pornography, it can be fornication, it can be adultery, whatever it may be. You're not walking the same path with God's people. You're not going in the same direction. You're not just passing through. The enemy is anchoring you here to this earth. And I really believe that that hinders this cry in the heart. I want to be with the Lord. I want to see him face to face. Because how can you desire to see him face to face when you know the books are going to be open? And you're going to have to stand and give an account of every lust that you're indulging in now. Everything that has not been crucified and mortified by the power of the Holy Ghost. And what Peter's trying to say, there, there needs to be more than just a confession that you're passing through. There's got to be a confession, Lord, I still have something in my life that's holding me back. There's still something there that has not been dealt with. Oh, God, I want the power of the Holy Ghost. I want to hate this thing. I want to be delivered. Some of you are still blowing smoke in Jesus' face. 
you know, you, you go to the prayer meeting and then you go out and light your cigarette and I, I see you blowing smoke right in his face. And folks, he wants you to be free. He wants you to be absolutely free that you can enjoy his presence. You enjoy the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, the scripture makes it so clear. Be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. The Bible says there shall be two in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord, your Lord, doth come. Do you understand? He's saying you don't know the hour that your Lord doth come. Now, I thank God for everyone in this house that's confessed Jesus as Lord. Thank God that you've made an attempt. You, you really deep inside, you want to change. But I, I have got this urgency of the Holy Spirit on me. And I'm trying to say it calmly so you don't think there's any anger in me or some personal vendetta. No, no, no. It's that, that we as shepherds are going to have to stand before the throne of God and give an answer. And we're going to have to answer if, if, if on our watch you became lukewarm. If on our watch you became sensuous. On our watch you did not have such a convicting word that it, it absolutely convicted you. Until there was a word, a finger, a prophetic finger placed right before you and said, You're the man, you're the woman, God is dealing with you. God is speaking to you about your sin. God is saying you can't go on. You're not going to, you're not going to this new land. You're not going with the saints because you are still bound. You are chained to this earth. You are anchored here. You're not free. Two shall be in the field. One shall be taken the other. Which one are you going to be? Can you imagine what it's going to be like? You know, the, the, I've just read to you, be ready. For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man come. The Bible says he's coming suddenly. The Bible says we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. That's just a split second. The Lord is going to come and he's going to take away his people. He's going to take his bride from this earth. Some people call it rapture. Some people call it capture. Those aren't biblical terms. I just say it, the, the Bible says it's a calling away. He's going to take away his people. They're going to be gone. And I believe that can happen at any moment. I believe it can happen while I'm preaching. I believe it can happen the next moment. And I, I honestly believe the majority of you would go home with me. Because you see, I'm going to my father's house and I'm trying to bring you along. I'm trying to bring along a whole house. But can you imagine that moment when he comes if it would happen in the service this morning? And we're talking about the lust of the flesh and those things that need to be dealt with and we put off and we won't deal with them. Because we've told you the Holy Ghost has all the power you ever need. That if you go to him and ask for hatred for that sin, if you go to him and say, Lord, this is beyond me. If you will go to him and believe with all of your heart that he has the power. If you quit trying to do it in your own strength, but you say, I am not going to give in to this. I am not going to live with this. I, I will not be satisfied until I know the Holy Ghost has empowered me. He will empower you. He will give you strength. He will give you Christian friends to stand with you. He'll give you someone you can talk to about it and get on the phone. There'll be a brother or sister that will stand with you. God will see you through and God will deliver you. But if you still love your sin and you hanker towards your sin and you go with it in spite of all of our preaching and everything else. I, I, I'm amazed. I'm amazed that some have been coming to this church for a number of years and still holding grudges after all that we've preached from this pulpit. Somebody took your seat. I know a sister had been mad for three months at a sister that took her seat. She walks over here because she's, well, I shouldn't point. <laughs> Folks, this is serious business. How in the world do you expect to be forgiven? Lord says, if you don't forgive others, I can't forgive you. Now, God means that. 
That means you're going to be left behind. I believe this with all my heart that God does not overlook what he is so clearly defined in his word. The Bible school was here on Tuesday. You know, some 80 students. And they're just worshiping and the glory of the Lord touched this house. The power of the Lord. And I'll tell you why. The day before and even the morning before they came in chapel service. The Spirit of the Lord came on them and told every one of them to go to one another and make everything right. No grudges. That you don't go to Times Square Church. You don't sit in the choir. You don't minister as a minister of the Lord. You don't sing. You don't open your mouth until everything is right. And because everything was right, the power of the Lord came down. The anointing was there. How in the world do you expect to face the coming of the Lord? If there's somebody you can sit here in this meeting right now and know that you have a grudge against. Can you imagine what it's going to be like should Jesus come in the next five minutes? Can you imagine the silence that will hit this building when, when musicians are gone and the choir is gone and the pastors are gone? There's no preacher left. No teachers left. There'll be a handful of people all over the building. You won't be sitting then. There would be a scream and a cry. There would be heart rending. And you would give anything in the world that you could relive the last five minutes before Jesus came so that you could make it right. That you could confront your sin. But that's the mercy of the Lord says, the door is open now. The door is open now. I'm not going to prolong this. I, I, I've, I've said what I want to say, but I, I know with all my heart that there are many of you here this morning. God is saying, clearly, first of all, to those who are going through a great uh, testing, a great despair, depression, or a battle that you can't understand, you can't explain it. Don't blame it on the devil. God is allowing it most likely. He's saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for turning up the furnace. You're trying to get my eyes on heavenly things. You're trying to refocus me. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid of it. And if you're here this morning, you've got that divine dissatisfaction. Thank God for that. You're just reaching out to something that's beyond this world. Hallelujah. It's a good thing. And for you that have a sin still sucking your spiritual life blood out of you, I ask you to bring it to Jesus this morning. There's a song we sing in this church. Come and go with me to my father's house, to my father's. Folks, that's where I'm going, and I want you to go with me. Hallelujah. Will you stand? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your everlasting mercy, your tender, loving mercies, and your kindness. Holy Ghost, you're speaking kindly to everyone within the sound of my voice. You're speaking kindly, not roughly, not with judgment, but with kindness and with mercy. Saying, come to me and be free. Come to me and lay down your idol. Come to me and lay down your sin. And I'll deliver you. And I'll bring you into the joy of the Lord. And I'll bring you to myself. I'll heal you. I'll minister to you. You'll be my friend and I'll be a God to you and you'll be a son or daughter to me. And I'll delight in you as you delight in me. Oh God, speak with conviction all over this place. Those, Lord, that are dealing with grudges, with bitterness, or with hatred. Oh, God, remove that. Don't let anybody stand in this church with that spirit still there. Lord, let there be restitution. Let them go to that person and make it right. Hallelujah. Jesus, you're coming soon. You're coming as right at the door. Hallelujah. Lord, I have in my heart right now the same desire Paul had, I have a desire to depart and be with the Lord. That would be my greatest joy this morning. 
Even so, come Lord Jesus. The greatest joy is to know that we're going home to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If God, by his spirit's dinning with you, want to get out of your seat and come and stand here right now and say, Jesus, I hear you. Holy Ghost, I hear you. I want to be free. I want to be delivered. I don't care what it is. The Lord wants to deliver you this morning. And if Holy Ghost has spoken to you and you have been rooted, you don't have this expectancy of the Lord's coming and say, Lord, awaken my spirit. I've been lukewarm. Maybe you've been drifting from the Lord. You don't have that love that you once had. If you're not right with God, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not right with the Lord, or if you've slipped, I want you to come right now back to his precious love. He wants to touch you and he wants to heal you in this service. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side, and you come down any aisle. Amen. Talking. But let me talk to you that came. Look this way, if you will, please. The one thing the Holy Spirit was speaking to me while we were singing, while you were gathering here, was that he wanted to give you his assurance and his peace that many of you have been lacking. And sometimes that's by your own fear or by a guilt that the enemy, enemy comes in. But it's also some of you have lost your peace because when you're in sin or when you're bound by something, you lose your peace. The peace of God comes to those who have a repentant heart. He gives peace to those who repent, those who turn from their iniquities, who hate their sin. Now, look at me, please. We preach from this church. We preach from this pulpit that you in your own strength cannot fight the devil or sin. You can't do it in your own strength. You've tried and you failed. It's been up and down. Sin confess, sin confess. You go right back to it. But there has to come a time in a meeting like this where you say, God, with, it, with the best I know how, with everything in me, I don't want anything in my life that's unlike you. I don't want it anymore. God, put that in my heart. Quicken my will that I will do what you want me to do. I have a will, Lord, that's been quickened by your Holy Spirit. That you'll cause me to want to hate sin. You'll cause me to want to walk with you. And, and many of you that are here right now, you say, Brother Dave, I came forward because I'm really in that kind of crisis you talked about. I'm in a battle of my life. Nobody around you knows, as you stand here now, nobody can read your mind. Nobody knows what you're going through, but certainly the Holy Ghost does. And when the Holy Ghost sees that, if you, all you have to have is a hungry heart, a reaching heart. I was in prayer last night. In fact, when I went to bed, I was laying on my bed and the Holy Spirit came upon me before I went to sleep. And that still small voice was, God says, all I'm looking for. One thing I desire above everything else, that you simply give me your heart, David. Just give me your heart. If you give me your heart, I'll work all these things out in your life. All of these things around here. But in the center of it all has to be a heart that's yielded. A heart that hungers for God. And the Holy Spirit says, David, the Lord sees your hunger. He sees your reaching out. And that's what God wants. Oh, God comes on the scene. The Holy Ghost comes on the scene. The moment your heart reaches out and you cry, oh, God, I want everything you have for me. Jesus, I want you. I love you. I need you. And you reach out to him. He comes. Oh, does he come quickly? He responds. He says, I'll be a God to you now. You'll be my son. You'll be my daughter. And you know what it means for him to be a God to you? That every power he has, all the resources of God are at your disposal. That God says, I'm going to fight your battle with you now. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to stand with you. I'm not going to let the, the devil destroy you. I'm not going to let your temptation override you. I'm not going to let your lust bring you down. I'm going to deliver you. Hallelujah. I'm going to set you free. Hallelujah. I want everybody came forward to pray this prayer with me. Now, it doesn't mean anything unless it comes from your heart. Like I said, the Lord's looking down deep. Will you give me your heart? Pray this to me. Jesus, the best I know how, I give you my heart. Everything in my heart. Take away all the sin, all the desire for the things of this world, and put a desire in me to love you and to walk with you. I thank you, Jesus. For your presence here now. You've been talking to me. And I receive your word. 
into my heart as my life. Cleanse me. Sanctify me. Give me a new heart. I thank you, Jesus, that you do love me, that you forgive me. Now, I bring my lust to you. I bring everything that's unlike you right to your feet. And I say, Jesus, take it away. Deliver me and set me free. I believe you now. Your word is true. You will keep me from falling. You're going to keep me by your grace and your power. In Jesus' name. Now let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your great faithfulness. Hallelujah. You're here right now changing. And the good work that you've begun, you said you will finish. The good work that you've begun, you will finish until the day of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want everybody that came forward. In fact, I want everybody in this house that loves Jesus. Now, you thank him for his grace. and Raise your hands and just thank him for it right now. Lord, I thank you. We lift our hands and we say thank you for the grace of God, the mercy of God, the healing power of Christ to deliver us from sin and lust, to purge us and to cleanse us, make us righteous in Christ, the righteousness of Jesus by faith that is ours now. By simple childlike faith. Hallelujah. How many of you came forward believe that you're <clears throat> going to the city of God that Abraham talked about? I'm going to the city. Let's sing that. How many go with me to my father's house? This is the conclusion of the message.